Hello, it's Red Recap speaking. Today, I will be giving a rundown of the movie Identity, which was released in 2003. Please note that there will be spoilers in my review. Without further ado, let's dive into the film. Late at night, a district attorney is going through the files of Malcolm Rivers, accused of the brutal murder of six people. The group of people he killed are almost the same, while the last two are Malcolm and his mother. Malcolm had an unfortunate childhood, his mother was a prostitute and abandoned him in a motel when he was only nine years old. His father is still missing, so Malcolm grew up in an orphanage. The court sentenced Rivers to death, but a well-known psychiatrist, Dr. Malik, speaks in his defense and demands that the court declare the perpetrator insane. Malik calls the district attorney and tells him that a new court hearing will be held at midnight because Rivers' lawyer has found his diary and demands that the death penalty be reversed. The scene shifts to a roadside motel. A car abruptly stops in front of the front door. A man with a bloodied wife in his arms bursts into the building. Next, we are shown several flashbacks. York's family was driving in the pouring rain when suddenly the front wheel burst, and the man, George, barely managed to keep the car from crashing. The cause of all this turns out to be the woman's shoe on the road by a former prostitute named Paris. The girl sitting behind the wheel was trying to find the lighter with one hand among the other stuff, and as a result, the shoe ended up on the road. It's already dark outside, and George is still struggling with the wheel. His son, Timothy, is playing inside the car. His mother, Alice, decides to play with his son and go out on the road, and at that very moment she is hit by a black car. George is shocked, he rushes to see what's going on. The scene swiftly shifts to a flashback of what was going on in the black car a few seconds before the accident. Ed, an ex-cop, is driving the actress Caroline Suzanne, who distracts him by asking to find a charger for her. Ed fails to notice Alice on the road and hits her at high speed. Ed gets out of the car to help the victim. The actress locks herself in the car and refuses to give up her phone. But time is short, so Ed breaks the window and takes her cell phone by force. Meanwhile, Paris encounters an obstacle, the road is washed out. The girl wants to turn around but crashes into a lamp post. Meanwhile, Ed brings the whole group to the motel to help the injured Alice. It turns out that there is no connection and the nearest hospital is far away. Ed decides to drive despite the bad weather, because Alice doesn't have much time left. The actress is outraged, as she wants to get to her destination as soon as possible, but Ed kicks her out of the car and leaves. On the way, Ed finds Paris, who tells him he can't go further, because the road is flooded. While Edward personally makes sure of this, the motel owner, Larry, puts Caroline in his best room. Later, when Ed encounters a young couple on the road, Lou and Ginny, he learns that the road is even more washed out in the opposite direction, and they all return together to the roadside motel. Edward uses a needle and thread to stitch up the laceration on Alice's wound. In the meantime, Larry accommodates two more people who have arrived, Inspector Rhodes and the imprisoned Maine. Because of the empty tank, Rhodes was forced to stop here, and to keep Maine from escaping, the inspector shen the criminal in the bathroom. Then the inspector goes outside, where he meets Paris. The man tries to hit on her, but to no avail. All the guests have already settled in, and everyone is minding their own business. Rhodes covers the blood stain on his back with his jacket, and Caroline rehearses her speech in front of the mirror without noticing the mysterious figures lurking behind the curtain. Suddenly, the phone makes a sound. There must be a signal. The woman immediately goes outside, but it's pouring like a bucket. She tears open the bathroom curtain and goes in search of the signal, but as soon as Caroline steps outside the motel, she is attacked by someone. Despite all the absorbing noise of the downpour, Ed hears a strange sound. Stepping outside, the man finds a broken hook for a curtain rod, and a little later, another trace leads the man to the laundry room, where several machines are working. In one of the machines, something is rattling hard. One by one, Edward looks into each of them, and in the last one, to his horror, he finds the smeared clothes on the woman's head. Suddenly, something falls outside the window, it turns out to be Larry and Rhodes. After examining the washing machine, the men find the key to room 10, which is Rhodes' room. Rushing into the room, Rhodes finds the room empty, and the criminal, Maine, has escaped. The story of the corpse and the fugitive criminal creates panic among the other guests. Rhodes and Ed arm themselves with guns and go in search of Maine, while the others gather in the common room. Ginny, however, is unable to control her emotions. In a panic, she runs out and Lou runs after her, trying to convince her to stay. A distraught Ginny blurts out to her husband that she is not really pregnant, she invented it just so that Lou would marry her in Vegas. The news pisses the guy off, the girl locks herself in the bathroom and doesn't want to let her husband see her. And then, with renewed vigor, Lou tries to break down the bathroom door, much to Ginny's consternation. Suddenly, there is total silence. 
After opening the door, the girl sees a silhouette with a knife and tries to close the door again, but an unknown assailant tries to stop her. Ginny manages to escape through the window. Rhodes and the others run to her screams. They find Lou dead in the room, the mysterious killer has struck again. At the same time, the escaped criminal, Maine, sees the lights of a restaurant in the distance. Once there, he enters the empty room and is horrified to find himself back in the motel. There, Rhodes finds him, and a fight breaks out. Ed rushes to the inspector's aid. The tension among the guests begins to subside, for they are sure that all these murders are the work of Maine. So now they are relieved, since the criminal is captured. Ed ties up Maine, and then asks Larry to guard him. Meanwhile, Alice wakes up and calls Timothy and George to her. The poor woman doesn't remember anything, and George runs out of the room looking for aspirin. Paris asks George to check on Ginny while she's away for a few minutes, but the happy husband doesn't care, because his wife has come to her senses. Then Paris goes to her room to get the cash left there and encounters Ed on the way. When asked what he is doing here, Ed just answers that he is taking pictures of evidence. A dialogue ensues between them. Paris asks Ed why he left the police, to which the man tells a sad story. He once tried to save a young pregnant woman from suicide. He tried to persuade her not to do it, but she jumped anyway. He has had severe headaches ever since. While taking pictures, Ed notices key number 9 in the dead man's hands. The man immediately goes to Rhodes to show him what he has found. Suddenly, they notice Larry coming out of his office. Ed is surprised, because Larry was supposed to be watching Maine. Rhodes immediately rushes to the killer's room but freezes in place. Someone killed Maine by shoving a baseball bat down his throat. Rhodes takes out his anger on Larry and accuses him of murder, but the motel owner swears he didn't do it. They find a key with a number 8 tag at Maine's feet and question Larry again. Then Larry Mann pulls out his keys, wanting to prove his innocence, but drops Caroline's belongings, which he had stolen from the room after her death. Being cornered, Larry threatens to kill Paris if they continue to try to pin the murders on him. However, as Larry stumbles, he falls and Paris grabs the refrigerator handle, from which a frozen corpse of an unknown man falls. Taking advantage of the confusion, Larry runs outside into the street and gets behind the wheel of his pickup truck. George, who is nearby, notices that his son, Timothy, is in the way and throws himself under the wheels in the hope of saving the boy. Larry, at high speed, pins George against the wall. Ed and Rhodes tie up Larry, and he confesses that he didn't kill the man in the refrigerator. A month ago, he lost his way in Vegas, and when he ran out of gas, he pulled up outside a motel. There was not a soul around, and he found a dead man lying in the office. So Larry decided to hide it in the freezer to save it from decomposition and wait for the dead man's relatives, but no one arrived. At this point, Larry decided to stay in the motel as a manager to earn some money. Ginny freaks out and thinks this is all happening to them because the motel is cursed. According to the guidebooks, 100 years ago there was a cemetery in its place, but no one believes her. Then the girl draws parallels with Agatha Christie's novel Ten Negritos, in which everyone was killed one by one. This means that they are all connected to each other. After a while, Rhodes notices that Alice is dead and calls Ed. By the woman's bed, they find the key number six, but then where is the seventh? After driving Larry's car away, Rhodes searches George's pockets and finds the seventh key, but it can't be real. Paris saw the whole thing with her own eyes. It was an accident, and there is no way to set it up. Ed asks Ginny and Paris to pick up Timothy and ride in the car until dawn. When Ginny and the boy run to the car, Inspector Rhodes tries to prevent this, in his opinion, they can't let the suspects go. But then there is an explosion, and Ginny and Timothy are killed. Larry, freed from the ropes, rushes with a fire extinguisher to the car, but when the fire goes out, the remains of the woman and child are nowhere to be found. Rhodes blames Ed for what happened and leaves, but then he notices that George's corpse mysteriously disappeared. The other dead bodies are gone too, even the blood is gone from the crime scene. Paris gets nervous and screams that she gives up. She thinks that mystical forces are behind it all, and Paris blurts out that she wants to live, to grow oranges on her plantation, and that she is still too young to die because next week she will only turn 30 years old. Larry, who has heard her words, admits that his birthday is also next week, on the 10th. Everyone else joins the conversation, and all birthdays on the same day. Larry checks the copies of everyone's IDs from the night they checked into the motel, and indeed, it's May 10th for all of them. What a strange coincidence, the odds of that happening are only 1 in 10 trillion. Suddenly, lightning strikes the motel and de-energizes the building. Rhodes, Paris, and Larry go in search of the switchboard. Ed is left looking at the ID cards of the guests. The man notices that they are all named after states. 
While thinking about it, Ed hears a voice asking him who he is. Suddenly, Ed finds himself in a straitjacket in front of the psychiatrist, Malik. The man asks Ed why he missed the last meeting, to which Ed tells him how he drove an actress and had to stop at a motel because of a downpour, where people began to die. Then Malik tells Ed the story of Malcolm Rivers, who is on trial for committing six particularly brutal murders. He explains that as a child, Rivers suffered a severe mental trauma that caused his consciousness to lose its associative connections and split into multiple personalities, and Ed is one of Rivers' personalities. Ed doesn't believe the doctor, then Malik hands him a mirror, in whose reflection Ed sees Malcolm Rivers. The man loses control and starts asking what they have done to his face. The psychiatrist tries to convince Ed that he doesn't exist, but Ed is sure that they all lie, he is not a figment of some child's fantasy, he is a living person. Then Malik explains to him that Rivers is now undergoing treatment, as a result of which the imaginary personalities are confronted and their numbers are bound to diminish. It is one of these personalities who has committed all the murders for which Rivers is being tried. If this personality can be eliminated, Malcolm will not be executed but will be sent to a mental institution. However, Ed no longer hears the psychiatrist's words, he wakes up again near the motel. Not far from the building, with the storm still raging around it, Rhodes and Larry find the switchboard, but they see almost nothing. Then Paris tries to find a flashlight in the police car but instead finds in the glove compartment the shipping papers of two prisoners, Maine and Rhodes. Also, in the trunk of the car, she finds the agent that Rhodes killed earlier and took his place. Now it's obvious why Rhodes has a blood stain on his back. The frightened Paris tries to find Ed, but, instead of him, Rhodes comes after her and demands that she give him the keys to the truck. Larry, who comes to the rescue, saves her by hitting Rhodes with a fire extinguisher. After a moment, Rhodes grabs his gun and shoots Larry. Paris runs away and finds Ed, who convinces the girl not to leave the motel and assures her that everything will be alright. Soon after, Rhodes arrives and Ed points his gun at him. The men shoot at each other simultaneously and Rhodes manages to fire three bullets before running out of bullets. Then Ed approaches him and brutally kills him by draining the entire magazine. Now, Paris is the only survivor of that terrifying motel. At dawn, Paris leaves the scary place. In the real world, psychiatrist Malik convinces the judge to overturn Malcolm Rivers' death sentence and send him to the mental hospital, because almost all of his personality the killer is dead. Rivers is transported to the clinic, and Paris arrives at the orange grove she has longed for. A little while later, loosening the ground under one of the trees, the woman finds a motel key with a one on the tag. Panic sets in, and almost immediately the figure of Timothy appears beside her, alive and unharmed, with a rake in his hands. Full of hatred, the boy prepares to kill her, while at the same time, in the real world, Rivers tries to stop Timothy, begging him not to do it. Malik notices that something is going on with his patient and opens the partition. In the same instant, Timothy kills Paris and River, his psychiatrist and driver. All the while, the killer was someone no one would ever think of, a little boy named Timothy. That's all from the video. Thanks for your time. And take care.